But thank you everyone for joining Majority Leader Shirky and I here today, whether you're in person or on Zoom. Uh, you know, yesterday we were hoping to hear a few things from the governor in her state of the state. And one of the most important things I wanted to hear was the spirit of cooperation that just hasn't existed since this pandemic has began. I wanted to hear how the governor was going to finally work with the legislature to heal and open this state. And I wanted to hear elements of a solid fact and science-based reopening plan with goals and targets and strategies that would guide us and allow us to measure our successes. I was glad to hear the governor say she wanted to work in a bipartisan manner. That's what the people of this state are hungry for. They're tired of political bickering. So I look forward to her new spirit of cooperation, but she still has no plan. The governor spent a lot of time patting herself on the back last night for successes we can't measure and for things that near happened nearly a year ago. But a leader's role is to look ahead, to have a vision and to translate that vision to a plan. And that's what she needs to do. The people of Michigan want desperately. If she's not hearing that, then she's not listening. But we in the legislature are listening. And we've created a plan that's a start and that we hope she can agree with so we can move this state forward. That's what the people want. That's what they deserve. And they, look, they want us to look ahead and get things done, and that's what we're going to do. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not going to make an opening statement. I think that richness of these gatherings like this is best served by getting directly into the questions and answers. And so who, uh, who wants to be the one to break the ice? Hi, Chrissy from Is it Chrissy or Christy? Christiana. 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 Okay, yeah, thank um, you. I have a question about um, your response this morning on the radio. You mentioned that the governor not wearing her mask was probably the most important aspect of her speech tonight. I'm wondering why you felt that was, and you know, out of everything that she said, context-wise, why was that most important? Well, as the speaker just said, she mostly was doing a rearview mirror presentation, so there wasn't that much uh, content in the actual presentation, although it was delivered well. But I'm really glad you asked the question, because the point is this. Um, we need to move the state out of a state of control and fear into one of trust and hope and opportunity. And when I saw her in front of the screen, on the screen, with her mask off, and I said she looks delightful, I meant it. But it also, I think, could be the beginning of moving from that, this notion of control and fear into another stage. It doesn't mean that masks aren't important. It doesn't mean that masks aren't useful. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't wear masks, especially when we're in places where people are, could be vulnerable. But it's, it, to me, gestures and symbols matter. And seeing her in front of a, seeing her in a press conference wearing a mask I think sends a very strange symbol. And seeing her last night with a fresh face, I thought it was a fresh new look. And that's the meaning for my comment. Well, can you elaborate on you saying there was no content in what she was saying? Content. Oh, I think we'll get other questions along the, on the content stuff as we go along. Go ahead, pick somebody. Mr. Speaker. I think it, our goal is to get kids in, in the classroom as fast as possible. Uh, and, and I think incentivizing that will help schools you know, uh, speed that up and they understand they're gonna get this money and, and uh, help kids get into school. I think we all know that's the right thing to do. That's what the science says. Uh, we need to make sure that we're putting kids first and this is the first step of that. We think as quick as possible getting kids in the seats matter. I wanted to ask your guys' thoughts on the bipartisanship reach that the governor brought up. Uh, how genuine, uh, starting with you, Senator, how genuine did you feel like that was? Well, actions speak louder than words. And let me give you a data point, and you can go ahead and verify it because it's all true. Since March 13th of last year, I have been invited to one conversation with the governor, and, but invited to many presentations. The point being this, you can't govern, 
You can't acknowledge input from others by doing one-way, one-sided presentations. It requires a conversation. And so that's been her actions. Now, if she changes all of a sudden, that would be fantastic. And when I get a phone call or a text message or an email or a call to the staff that says, I'd like to invite the senator to have a conversation, not to a presentation, that'll be a big telltale sign for me. I guess uh, after last year when the Supreme Court took away the executive powers from the governor to include the legislature in that conversation, have you seen a difference in those months since then and how this process has worked out? No, I mean it just—it's not to what it's what people expected. That's what we, uh, you know, were expecting as a legislature. But she obviously went a different route through a different set of orders and and her ability to utilize the MDHHS to to continually acting unilaterally. What are you going to do about education? The schools feel like they're being held hostage right now. Yeah, and that's just not not the case. I mean, this is about getting kids back into the classroom. Schools are not being held hostage. Uh, the plan says exactly what we're trying to do, which I think everybody agrees with. Like I said, parents want their kids in classroom. Kids need to be in classrooms. Uh, and this is helping incentivize uh, that, that action. How do you guys feel like the governor's administration is doing on vaccine? Speaker, starting with you, how is she doing with the vaccine law, in your opinion? Um, it's not going well. Um, and that's, that's part of our plan, too, is to help increase uh, you know, the transparency and making it more clear for people who are trying to access a vaccine and trying to get a vaccine. Um, so I think it's been very clear that this, this rollout of the vaccine has been uh, dismal at best. And um, I think it's important that you know, we focus on vaccine rollout and vaccine distribution. That's what our plan does. So Kyle, when you're insular in trying to solve problems and you don't accept input from others, you leave behind opportunities to improve an idea. And, the, and I, I'm gonna give the governor just a little bit of grace on vaccines. It's a very complex problem. It's a very challenging logistics issue. And I believe her when she says that she wants it to be done robustly and quickly and so forth. But again, actions speak louder than words. There was not a single conversation with the Senate, I suspect, nor with the House, on how could we actually help improve the process, help improve the messaging, and par partner in achieving a common goal. But when there's only presentations and no conversations, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, Paul Williams from Law 360 would like to know what is the leadership stance on the governor's proposed good jobs for Michigan renewal? Do you support using corporate tax incentives to help boost the economy to get them recovery? Yeah, I think that honestly is a slap in the face to small businesses across our state. Uh, you know, just last month, I think it was, the governor was calling a, a deposit into the UIA trust fund to help small businesses and those that they uh, were forced to, to put in unemployment to help them continue to pay for that. Uh, it's, 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 she called that a corporate, corporate welfare. And here she is in disguising this as, as COVID recovery, and I just don't think that's the case. Uh, Good Jobs for Michigan is not a discussion we should be having during a pandemic and during a COVID recovery plan that we're trying to set forth. So it's just hypocritical talk. It's the same political uh, stunts that she's, she's tried in the past. I'm sorry, I missed that last part. How are you trying to get as much done with not as much money? So the fact is the legislature has been into, uh, you know, obviously we were canceled last week. So we've had two business days this term. In the 101st legislature, we've had two business days. And we just, we just introduced a $3.5 billion COVID recovery plan in two business days. We had a hearing on it. That is, that is a sense of urgency. That is a sense of commitment to make sure that the people of the state are getting the resources they need as quick as possible. So like I said before, the governor's plan, there, there really isn't a plan. It's bullet points. The legislature appropriates those dollars. And in two business days, we put forth a plan that, that will appropriate three and a half billion dollars. That's a high sense of urgency. And to me, it's, it's kind of corny, I think, I think disingenuous, to characterize it as you did and assuming that the rest of the money may not be there just there needs to be time put into it, thought put into it. And so nobody's suggesting that it's going to be finite to that. There's more to consider. Regarding the budget, um, 
the appropriation <coughs> towards vaccines and testing was uh, in Reverend Albert's plan is uh, brought up. It, it's going to be appropriated quarterly. Uh, so it was like 22 million per quarter, 22 million per quarter, 144 million for, uh, for vaccines. And the reason for that was to provide oversight was in his press release over how these things are done. What specific levers of oversight would you need to see in order to feel confident to continue giving out that quarterly appropriation for the plan? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's about oversight, efficiency, accountability of the administration, which is stuff that we have not seen. In her plan, there is no accountability. There is no oversight or efficiencies. Uh, you know, um, even just transparency in the plan. It's confusing. Uh, you know, she, she, in, she uh, added another uh, category before the first category even was a chance to get finished. Uh, people are confused about who can get it, who can't. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we're looking at that each and every uh, step of the way so we can improve when necessary. Again, we want to be a part of that process. I think we can add value to that process, and that's what the chair is trying to do. One of the most important responsibilities of the legislature is oversight. And oversight can be viewed as being punitive, or what I, I choose to view it as and characterize it as, it's an opportunity to improve processes. It's an opportunity to learn from what you've done in the past and improve it going forward. So there's, you know, again, you always find what you're looking for. I probably will say that more than once today. You always find what you're looking for. If you're looking for it to be a punitive action, that's precisely what you'll find. But this oversight can be a very good thing. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a, speaker for, a question for Speaker Wentworth. On Monday, we said, you said you wanted to hear a tone of unity and um, focus on that shift. Did you hear that uh, last night when she was talking about common ground and she used unity a lot last night? Yeah, I think the tone the governor set was exactly what I think the people of Michigan want to hear. And like the senator said earlier, you know, action speaks louder than words. I'm, I'm looking forward to this newfound sense of bipartisanship and, and tone. Uh, but, but we need the action and not just the words and, and politics. So I, I'm definitely looking forward to that. Uh, Dean Foster says the House plan says it wants to give pandemic powers to local health departments, but the actual legislation introduced sets federal limits on what local health so I mean I think this is disingenuous too I mean we're not taking away the governor's pandemic powers her, her authority to to respond to a pandemic or MDHHS's authority to respond to a pandemic what we are trying to do is to get kids into the classroom get kids into seats and that's so it's disingenuous to say it in those way in that way in that question the fact is that that we need to get kids into seats. The parents want it. The science says it. Every other state in the country is, is doing it. And we need to make sure that Michigan isn't uh, left behind on that front. So we're putting that as a priority. We're putting kids and our families as a priority. It has nothing to do with legislative power, governor's authority to respond to a pandemic. Uh, it, it has everything to do with getting kids into seats. This is, we've heard the House's plan for the COVID. Is that basically what the Senate agrees with? Can we take that as the, the legislature's structure for negotiation? Well, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but they've taken two days to uh, craft it, which is lightning fast. I reserve the opportunity to have at least one day to review it before I make a comment like that. But it's, we're going to find common ground there, I'm sure. Kathy? The governor has, has talked about inviting leadership quad meetings on a, on a regular way basis that's also inviting you to the model of meetings that they're having about, about the COVID crisis and that um, attendance has been spot up. Um, is, is there a plan to um, try to increase those attendance of those types of things? Well, I reject the notion completely. Um, again, I'm going to repeat myself. We've been invited to a lots of presentations precious few conversations. Frankly, since February, March 13th of last year, I've been invited to one conversation with the governor. Um, almost the even, pardon me? What about the quadrant? Let me get to that. Let me get to that. Yeah. Give me a chance. Don't jump in front of me. The quadrant meetings, um, quite frankly, they're difficult to execute by Zoom, by remote. And, uh, and the, the agendas are very uh, brief. Uh, most of them have been in the mode of presenting, like I've said before, presenting, and only recently, thanks, thankfully to the Mr. Speaker, he's insisted, 
and I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed, I didn't think about it before either, but he's insisted that there be an agenda and we have an opportunity to actually impact the agenda, affect the agenda. And so th this week's was uniquely different because I had a, I had a point on the uh, uh, bullet on the agenda and uh, so did, um, so did, uh, who else was that? No, uh, it was uh, Jim Annick, Senator Annick had a point on the agenda. So there's a shift. I'll give credit where credit's due. But Kathy, up till now, there have been, and the, uh, the data meetings, again, presentations, no conversations, and there has never been a data meeting where we haven't had more than two, at least two, excuse me, uh, people from the Senate policy staff or senators themselves. Senator McGregor was almost on all of them when he was here before he es you know, escaped out of the uh, legislature. Um, Senator Vanderwall is on almost every one of them. We have at least one policy person on every one of them, and I've made about half of them. I got a few other things to work on. Too, so. And I'll echo that. Same thing with the House. We've had uh, members participate in those meetings as well. Representative Frederick has been on almost every one of them, if not all of them. Uh, so we've had either members of policy or, or members themselves. Plaintiff Seto, who would like to know what is the legislature planning to give up as part of the compromise deal with Whitmer on COVID funding? I mean, that's to be determined, right? We're, we're still in that, that phase of, you know, we just had our first hearing. We're going to continue through our legislative process. Uh, I'm hoping that the governor comes to the table and understands this is not about uh, a level of authority that she has or that we have. This is about getting resources to the people that need them across our state. I don't know why it has to be a zero-sum game. Maybe if we get together and talk, it could be even be more. Um, and then another one for both of you. Dave Eggert would like to know, Whitmer administration has been gradually lifting restrictions. What specifically would you like 100 capacity at restaurants and bars along? with no curfew, return of sports? Uh, yes. So I think that, you know, this the science-based, the fact-based, uh, data-driven decisions uh, that we're not hearing right now, uh, these dates that nobody knows that February 1st still is going to be the day. We keep talking about February 1st, that's going to be the day that we're going to reopen restaurants or to 25% capacity. That's not set in stone. The 15th or 16th in January wasn't set in stone. So I have business owners, restaurant owners that are concerned that that's not going to be the date. And then that, that right there is reckless, that, that these restaurant owners and, and people that are, that are staples in our community, that are, are family-owned uh, businesses, that, that have people that in the community that work for them, their, their own family, they consider in most cases, uh, it's, it's reckless, it's cruel. And uh, I believe that continuing down this path of not having concrete, measured uh, you know, success that we can point to to say, this is why we're going to reopen, uh, that's that's what's cruel in this state right now. You mind if I pile on that one? Listen, we've got two fantastic examples of why we have to press because she doesn't just change the move the goalpost; she changes rules. In the case of restaurants, restaurants were the earliest and the most ag aggressive adopters of safety protocols. They were, you know, and if, and if any restaurant wasn't, they deserved to be, you know, closed down. But the restaurant industry itself was one of the earliest adopters. They did a fantastic job and got their legs cut off from underneath them. High school sports. Kids have been doing everything they've been asked to do. And then legs cut off from underneath them. Changing the rules. Not just moving goalposts, but changing the rules. That's why we have to insist on you know, moving forward and, and clarity on what the expectations are. And then trust people to do them. Yesterday's actions on appointments was a purposeful political gesture. Not a gesture to score points, but a gesture to make a point. And until this governor stops acting unilaterally and invests in and encourages and invites in the legislature to be part of most of these decisions, not all, but many, then we're relegated to using the tools that are available to us through our Constitution and our statutes. And that was just one of them. But I don't want you to miss the point. That wasn't done to score political points. It was done to make a point. And to your question regarding opening restaurants, 
uh, that was the other part. What yeah. about you know, here's here's a res here's something I can't resolve. On one hand, you specify 25% capacity, and the other hand, you say, but the table's got to be six foot apart. Well, if you've got to be six foot apart, why do you have to have a capacity constraint? Put as many tables as you can six foot apart and forget the capacity constraint. Would I like that if I was a restaurant owner? No, but it'd be a whole lot better than arbitrarily deciding, not based on science or data. I hope you ask me about that later. Uh, this is all about arbitrary decisions. Couldn't have said it better. I don't think any restaurant, at least in my district, is asking to open up 100% capacity. They've already taken the precautions you know, in the last year to, to make sure that they can open safely and provide uh, the service safely. So many of them took these precautions prior to, to even having any, any restrictions at all. And this is about a personal responsibility. Um, so it's not about saying, do I support 100% reopening? It's about giving business owners the opportunity to survive, giving restaurants opportunities. 25% capacity, restaurants aren't gonna open at 25% capacity uh, unless they've already had you know, a particular following for carryout or something like that. They can open one or two tables in a small restaurant. But other than that, I just don't see restaurants magically opening up on, on, the, on the first, if, if we keep that date. It can, but it requires one very important element, listening. If she moves around the state and makes presentations, it will have no effect. But if she listens, it can be very helpful. And if it's helpful there and it works, maybe she'll apply it to the legislature at the same time. Yeah, so for me, yeah, we're, we're definitely putting ethics reform uh, at the top of our, of our list in the House. Uh, that will be a part of the package. Um, and, I, and I'm the type of, of leader that's starting with, with a clean slate, right? So the, the, introduction, the introduction of the legislation will be negotiated, will be you know, thought out, and went, it'll go through the legislative process. But we're not pre-baking things from last term. We're, we're going to start fresh, and we're going to move through the process. Uh, I think we owe that to our members, allow them to have input. We have a, a great new class of freshmen coming in both on the R side and the D side, and I'm encouraged by their willingness to work together, not just on ethics, but on other things. So I'm excited to see what kind of legislation they come up with. And I'll give you an example of one thing that would cause heartburn in the Senate. Just an example. I'm not saying that's gonna be in or out. I, don't really, I really don't know, because we haven't talked about it yet. But uh, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty dug in on opposition to financial disclosures of senators and, and uh, representatives. I think that's fodder for you to go after people, and it's unnecessary. We already have uh, rules in place for eliminating conflicts of interest, and I haven't had, haven't had anybody show me whether those rules have been spoiled or breached in my 10 years, frankly. And so I think it, that's just an example. But uh, for in the terms of the spirit and intent of uh, transparency, all in. Any more online uh, questions? Um, the governor has talked about $5 million uh, to put in the infrastructure necessary to, uh, uh, to check for weapons and people coming to the Capitol um, and with a, um, an end result of banning all guns in the Capitol. Um, is that dead on my own here? I couldn't have said it better. And just the fact that it's in, it's in a My COVID relief plan. The fact that it's in a My COVID relief plan is, is part of a problem, right? It's, it's, a, it's a project that she has that should not be included in it. If, if she wants to have that conversation, we can. Including it in a My COVID relief plan is not the direction that we should be going. Would either of you support inviting the governor and members of the administration to open meetings to discuss pandemic response plans? Um, well, I'll speak for, I've been for, the, for the last 
I won't say for the last year, I'll say it's starting probably in May. Every time we had a virtual um, quadrant meeting, I was usually typically ended the, the meeting saying, when can we actually get together? And I've been told, I'm not ready yet. Not, I've never been given any data and any science on that, it's just I'm not ready yet. And so I respect that, uh, although we seem to be getting along just famously here, uh, we can socially distance and keep everybody safe. Um, I hope somebody does some investigation into actually who's actually working in the Romney building. I don't think there's anybody working in the Romney building. And I'm not sure when the last time the staff was actually together. And you can do a lot with technology. It's a wonderful and beautiful thing. But you can't do as much as you can when you're in person. I think the, uh, the committee chair for the advice and consent committee, Senator Nesbitt, is going to, put to, I think next week, he's going to put it on the calendar. He's probably out, I would say, 30 days or so. Why, Maybe, so, huh? why so long? Why so long? Uh, give her an opportunity to get her sea legs. Uh, she's know, we know the, exactly the kinds of questions we're going to ask her. We want her to know those questions we're going to ask her and get her, give her a chance to have the, get her sea legs and study what's happened. So that's, it's an appropriate thing to do. Uh, for both of you, you mentioned that the governor should not include renewal of good jobs tax incentives in COVID relief plans. But separately from that, are you supportive of renewing the program? What Clark says is helpful to attract large scale business. Yeah, I'm just not willing to have the conversation as a part of a my COVID relief plan. I think it's it's a, it's what she had talked about prior to as a corporate handout uh, is exactly what she's trying to put into this plan now. And I think we can have the discussion later. We can have the conversation later, but not as part of a my COVID relief plan. My response to that is this. Um, when we actually can talk to each other, I think 95% of the time, we should be able to arrive at, this, at a common definition of a problem or an opportunity to exploit if you're talking to each other. And once we arrive at the definition of the problem we're trying to solve or the opportunity we're trying to exploit, then we can start talking about solutions. And they may be very different. But I guarantee you, when you're talking about different solutions, it almost always results in improving the best, the best one. And we may even, at the end, disagree on the final solution, but at least people had a chance to have input. And that is not happening, and that is not what people of Michigan signed up for when they, when they uh, elected this governor. It's not consistent with our Constitution, and it needs to change. 